we are going to have a great conversation here on the panel. And so I'd love to say, let's keep it chatty. Keep. Um, I know you guys are all friends. We're going to have some fun up here talking amongst ourselves and then with you as well. So thank you so much for joining us. So I am Jenny Achilles, Senior Program Officer at the Trellis Foundation. And it is an honor to spend today with you. And it is also an honor to spend the day with my three colleagues. So um, Dr. Danielle Strether is the Assistant Commissioner for Student Success at the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. And there she's responsible for overseeing student academic and career success through innovation, evidence-based strategy, through innovative evidence-based strategies to ensure that every student has the opportunity to succeed. So thank you for joining us. Thank you. We're also joined by Dr. Cynthia Farrell, who is the Executive Director of the Texas Success Center and also um, Vice President of the Texas Association of Community Colleges. And so we really appreciate your work supporting the implementation and scaling of the uh, Talent Strong Texas Pathways work there at the center. And then finally, I am joined by another Meadow, uh, a member of the Meadows team today, Keegan Henke, who is the Senior Vice President of Community Systems Innovation at the Center for Child and Family Wellness at the Meadows Mental Health Policy Institute. That is a mouthful. I'm sorry, Jenny. So she's bringing a lot to the table today, <laughs> in the title at least. So we really appreciate um, her uh, clinical expertise that she brings and then is able to bring that um, along with her understanding of change management to helping support the work. And she is one of the leaders um, helping support our post-secondary education mental well-being initiative with Meadows. So thank you all so much for joining me today. If you can give them um, a round of applause as we start. <laughs> I'd just like to note, Jenny, for the record, that I did have my socks on, and then I took them off. So. We had a whole conversation about, like, how much of our outfits it went with versus not. Um, but we did, we did think about it. Yeah. And I will, I will say one of our favorite things is for folks to rep us at other conferences and send us photos, so please feel free. <laughs> we love the socks. Um, well, thank you all. So this morning we heard from really... Um, Outstanding colleagues giving us the federal policy framework for, for this conversation today and the national practice level. Um, we have also heard from students, their concerns, as well as the work that they're doing in support of each other on college campuses. And then finally, before lunch, we heard from some incredible um, institutional leaders in giving us examples of what they're doing at their institutions. And so we really love that now we have the opportunity with our colleagues here to take that state-based approach. So we've heard the federal level, we've heard the institutional level, we've heard students, and now we're gonna dive in deep on, on statewide, what are we seeing and what can we learn and how can we ap apply that um, for our conversations going forward. So you guys are all positioned at organizations that have that statewide lens in the work that you're doing with the ability to aggregate learnings and trends in a way that can really help inform our conversation today. So today we want to hear what you're learning from those initiatives so far, and then also what next steps you would recommend for policymakers and for institutional leaders and practitioners who are here with us today. So that sets the frame. And I also, as we kick off the questions, um, just want to, apologies just want to reiterate what we heard so much from Chancellor Flores, and I really appreciated the reminder of the framing and basic needs, as well as the conversation we heard from our federal colleagues around the frame of public health. Um, both of those are so important, and at Trellis, we really did center this, uh, this RFP initially in that idea of mental well-being as a basic need, right? And the interplay between having your basic needs met or not, and how that affects mental health, and vice versa. So I have just appreciated that being underscored today, as well as the way that we think about this as public health in general. So I want to keep those two frames in mind as we move forward with our questions. So kicking us off, Dr. Strether. Hi. So as we're reflecting on the impact of federal policy, um, we just want to, and how it affects state programming, we're just going to dive right into gear funding. Um, mm -hmm. And what's been happening with that, we know that, that those federal dollars were a way that a lot of campuses were able to jumpstart 
maybe initiatives they've been thinking about doing for a while, and we know that a lot of folks did use those dollars for mental health programming. Um, so what did you see institutions supporting with those dollars? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, just wanted to say hello to everyone. Uh, I am um, so pleased to see so many people here talking about this topic. Um, just to add a little context, uh, I've been at the coordinating board now for two years, so after 25 on a campus. And the reason why I bring that up is that all of these conversations, um, I left a campus at 20, uh, 2022, and um, when the institutions were up speaking about COVID and the pre-pandemic and post-pandemic and the, and the work that we were doing, um, I was certainly right alongside with you all, knee deep in all of those things. So I really appreciate um, the opportunity that Trellis has provided for everyone to come together to talk about this. Um, as Dr. Okola mentioned earlier, this is a unique time um, where there is this national spotlight and um, it provides us the space to, to discuss these. And so I'm really um, grateful that uh, so many people are sitting at this table um, to, to discuss. Um, so back to the question on um, gear. So back in 2022, when I joined the agency, and as you um, recall, the commissioner mentioning starting um, a new division of, of student success that is super specific to student success initiatives. My first charge was to begin to um, plan and design a grant program to leverage gear funding. And um, one of those programs was our um, Student Success Acceleration Program. And we did it in two different phases. We started with the planning grant, um, where we had a direct award that we told institutions, we know this takes time to come up with an action plan. Um, here are our interventions that we would like to see um, institutions um, apply and tell us about what you are doing in these various interventions on your campuses. We will, um, for, the planning granting for the planning grant time, um, you can, uh, by the time it's done, you will have an action plan for the implementation grant portion of our program. So when that launched, uh, we had approximately 59 students, so the, um, on the implementation grant side, 59 grantees, not students, 59 institutions apply. And um, of those in various interventions, mental health, basic needs, wraparound services was um, one of those interventions. And we had over 17 institutions um, state that um, mental health was one of the uh, interventions. Um, 17 institutions said this is our primary. And we really want to take um, and leverage the dollars to do that. So we have just recently closed out um, uh, the, um, the gear funded planning grant, or the implementation grant. And um, through that time, so we were able to leverage about 12 million out into the, um, out into the field on uh, student success programming. What we learned, so getting to the second part, as after I uh, provided some context to the, the program, was that institutions were all over the spectrum of where they were in the planning process, implementation process of evidence-based student success strategies based on mental health and wellness for students. Um, Anywhere from, we've been doing this for a long time, we would love to have the grant in order to expand and scale these strategies to hire more staff, more counselors, to we have not spent any strategic time um, thinking about how to build the strategic plan around the campus in order to expand it campus-wide. So we had, um, just with our 17 institutions, a wide range of approaches. Um, and what we've learned to this point is that we have a ton of data. Um, we have just recently closed out the grant. And so what we want to do is spend, the next iteration is spend time with our partners. We were able to partner um, with Meadows and with the Hope Center. Um, every single grantee, 59 of them, had the opportunity to launch um, uh, a, a basic needs survey, and um, that was the other thing we learned was that 
institutions just wanted to understand what their students needed. And so this survey really gave them the opportunity to collect that data. We also, I think with the grant, gave them time to do this and so, um, and work with technical assistance providers to really dig into the data um, and come up with a good strategy to span campus-wide. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, and I, I love the focus on plan, understanding your student needs and planning as that undergirding. And I think Chancellor Flores also reminded us earlier, it's you plan, you iterate, you implement, you plan, you iterate, you implement, mm -hmm. rinse, and repeat. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, as we're expanding work in the state, and so another question for you, Dr. Strather, uh, you, the state of Texas, as we heard earlier today from our colleagues at SHEO, um, is one of the states that's part of that work. And so would love for you to share with us more um, for Texas what that work involves and, and what you're looking to do. Yeah, we were thrilled to um, receive the news that we were one of five states to receive the planning grant through SHEO, which that's the State Higher Education Executive Officers Association. Um, and so uh, I always explain it because not everybody knows SHEO. And, um, but Sakshi did such a great job earlier talking about the learning community and what um, our proposal that ultimately was accepted by SHEO was um, for us to have the time to dig into the data. So our um, friends at Trellis also had a learning community. Um, they have a ton of information um, and data. The R planning grant and implementation grant resulted in a ton of data. And by, um, it, by combining all of the data, bringing multiple people to the table, um, multiple organizations that have been doing this work, um, uh, particularly in the last two years, um, really gives us an opportunity to dig in, think statewide, um, and our ultimate goal is um, to hopefully have a statewide higher ed plan on um, mental health that will eventually go to the commissioner for review and approval. Thank you. As we're gearing up for that statewide plan, I know that one of the colleagues who can really inform and, and give, give context for us, Dr. Farrell, you have the unique uh, opportunity of, of being in contact with representatives from community colleges across the state. So the TAC is an important resource in our, in our state, and you are one of the folks I know the Trellis Foundation looks to to really understand the needs of, of college campuses. So what are you hearing from leaders? And we heard from three today, but like, what are you hearing across the state about the needs that leaders are seeing for their students in terms of mental health? So thank you for the question, Jenny. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you all for being here. Um, this is exciting to see um, that we have so many colleagues and friends that care so very much about students' success and their mental health and how that's so integral. I've been really encouraged by the conversations that I've heard already about how much work has already been done. I love that where we are as a state, that we are not sitting around saying, well, whose job is this? It's not mine. Um, as a community college, um, we, if, I, if, I don't, if you don't mind, I'm just going to give a little context as well before I jump into what I'm hearing from the leaders. For those of you who don't know us, um, the Texas Association of Community Colleges is the association that all of the presidents and chancellors voluntarily um, fellowship together um, and have shared um, resources together so that they can do primarily advocacy for community colleges at the Capitol, but also a, a, another arm of ours is the um, the Community College Association of Texas Trustees. So both the presidents and the trustees have an association. But then the third arm is the Texas Success Center. So the Texas Success Center is 100% grant funded, and our whole job is to come alongside the colleges and help them uh, forward their mission, which is to um, help Texans have better lives through post-secondary higher education. And so we had decided at one time that um, when we looked around at all the different initiatives that were happening, we had so many people doing so many uh, great projects, um, but they were happening um, unconnected. So the colleges, College A didn't know what College B was doing, and even College A might do something for a while, 
but then they would go to another initiative and it wasn't affecting the whole institution. And so we decided what we really needed to do was take a time out, so set up our whole statewide strategy by first of all learning from all of the initiatives that had happened before us and say, you know, like, like, let's start from scratch here. We've learned some things about leadership, about data, some things you've heard um, on these panels and that we needed to know more about our students and to treat them more holistically. And so about six years ago, we decided that we would start our first Texas Pathways strategy where all of the community colleges in Texas voluntarily signed on to a single strategy where we would build a framework that all of our initiatives would hang from, we would learn from them, we would figure out which ones were working well and we would begin to scale them. And things that weren't working well, we would stop doing because we had limited resources. We realized that our folks were so busy doing initiatives that they were, they were working very hard and they were caring very hard for their students, but we weren't making progress because we hadn't organized it well. And so our statewide strategy has now evolved into the Talent Strong Texas Pathways. And the two main components are really the marriage of the things we've been talking about today. We, we all in this room believe that if we can help students get credentials as quickly as possible, and you know, those stackable credentials, towards high paying jobs, they're gonna have a better life. But we know that they are complex human beings just like each one of us, that they, that doesn't happen in isolation. We also have to holistically look at the student and care for a wide variety of basic needs, mental health being one, transportation and childcare and finances, um, are, are a whole set of things that the community colleges really have embraced as they signed on to this strategy. Um, so the way that we support the colleges primarily is twice a year, we come away from our whirlwind jobs and we basically do like a family retreat, a family reunion of sorts, um, where for three days we step aside and we have good conversations with each other about what's working, what's not working, to encourage each other when this work gets really hard and gets, get, you, you look at, you look at really um, crazy data, you look at really sad data, um, you grapple with that with your friends that you can be honest about. Um, so we spend those days together, they come, they look at data, and they leave with an action plan. So I love that when you heard from the colleges um, how they're doing this work, that's exactly how the center is supporting it in a statewide way. And so back to your question about what leaders are doing, I give a perfect example. Just last week we had our three day Institute. So all of the college leadership teams come together. So we're talking about CEOs, all the chancellors and the presidents, the chief academic officers, the chief student support officers, and then other leaders in their college. Um, we learned that from the past. We learned that if we wanted to really make sustainable change, we needed to have the right folks in the room, and we needed them to change in ways that would last even beyond themselves. So we also have a Board of Trustees Institute where we have the chancellors, the presidents, and their, seat, and their um, trustees come away. I wish that the Alamo trustee had stayed. I wanted to tell a story about him. I might tell you anyway. <laughs> um, um, but uh, uh, ways that they can change their institution in lasting ways, like in their strategic plans and in their mission statements and the kind of data that the trustees look at regularly. These are things that really change an institution, can change the climate, can change what's important, can change the budget, how it's allocated. Um, so we knew that we needed to work with these leaders and we needed to do it in a way that no matter where they went, everywhere around the state, when they talked to each other, they were reinforcing each other's good work. So I'm just gonna tell you the one little story about Alamo. I remember the day when we were at a Board of Trustees Institute, and this has been years ago, maybe as many as 10 years ago, and the Alamo team had, the chancellor was there with his trustees and they decided that they were no longer going to do pilots. So for them, they had these recurring pilots where they would learn something a little bit, but it never changed for a long time. And they'd do a little pilot here and a little pilot there. So even when you heard Chancellor Flores' story, it really relates back to that their trustees said, we're gonna stop doing this because we need real lasting change and we need to do it faster than we've ever done it before. So let's learn, but then let's be dedicated to scaling for all students, not just a few students who are lucky enough to get in a certain class or a certain service. So last week we were together at the Institute and the, and the topic of the Institute was around this um, holistic 
How do you marriage both the academic and the support services uh, for students? And in particular, we were zeroing in on what do you do right away early in a, in, a, in a student's experience with the college? What can you do right at the front door so that they feel welcomed and included, that they, they feel like they've come over to a friend's house, that they had a friend on the inside that was really gonna help them, whether they brought the, the sort of college uh, collateral with them or whether they got it once they got to the door that they knew that they had friends that were gonna help them get enrolled and get in the right classes and have someone to talk to and be with. Um, so the, the colleges came together and they looked at data. So this is another thing of the strength of having a statewide strategy is that there are some colleges who have really large um, institutional research and data units and there are some that maybe have one person who's wearing multiple hats. And so we wanted every college in the state Really, we wanted any student in the state who goes to any community college in our state would have equal opportunity to have their needs met. And it, the one way that we could sort of democratize data was that we bring data to the institution. So there are some institutions that have lots more data than what they get with us, and others, this is their primary source of data. And so they do pre-work before the institutes where they look at both quantitative and qualitative data. They conduct focus groups. Um, they meet together before they come to the institute to understand their data. And then when they are at the institute, then they have good conversations about what is this data really telling us? How can we get beyond understanding the data and really turning that into action? Um, so they do that in their conversations while they're with us. And so that's what leaders do when they are part of our strategy. Thank you. And so speaking of last week and how we think about supports for institutions, for colleges across the state. Um, rumor is you have some exciting news that may involve some other partners in this room. <laughs> and it's been shared, but we keep trying to share it more publicly so that more and more folks can know and make sure they're involved. Do you mind sharing about the, that initiative? I'd love to, I'd love to. So um, we conduct this work through a lot of great partnerships, many partnerships that I see, I'm looking around the room of partnerships who've helped us um, serve our colleges better. So thank you for being friends to the, Center, um, we have a new partnership with the Meadows Mental Health Institute that uh, is called Minding College Minds. And so um, knowing that we were dedicated to student success and seeing that we had such a great partner that literally is across the street from us, <laughs> literally, literally <laughs> um, we decided that we would go into a partnership together. And we, what we dreamed up is how could we take the lessons, particularly that were learned in the trellis learning community, and how could we take that to all students who are attending all community colleges in our state? And so through a few generous uh, foundations getting us started, we had a planning grant that ended in January. And during that planning time, we built this model, this framework for mental health supports that community colleges could then implement and scale. And so I'm sure Tegan can say way more about the content uh, because they're the content experts. Um, but our teams just met together and became instant friends together. Um, such a great uh, partnership to building a framework. Um, and I'll just say this and then Tegan, you fill in the blanks. But we sort of soft launched the Binding College Minds last week with the community colleges who came to our institute. We had a pre-institute so they could spend three hours in a workshop together. The room was absolutely packed um, at the community colleges who wanna be a part of this work. Um, there's two opportunities for them. One is, and this is another way that we learn and inform the overall strategy and serve everyone. We might do a pilot for a minute and then we give it to everyone, right? So this is the way we built this model that um, beginning uh, this fall, then the, um, the Meadows mental health folks are going to have a series of learning communities where a few colleges are gonna come together, they're gonna try out our model, we're gonna learn together, but then at the same time, the, the center is also gonna be learning from these uh, learning communities so that we can build out curriculum then will automatically, simultaneously be going out to all of the colleges through our institute model. We're just absolutely thrilled that we have this kind of curriculum that's per particularly um, customized to the community colleges and fits within there. So it's not like a competing another uh, in initiative. This is within their Talent Strong Texas Pathways strategy that they will be scaling up these practices. 
And I'll just add that uh, the conversation today has been so exciting because it really aligns very well. We took a, a public health approach to the model that we're proposing. And so we're really looking at how institutions can think about universally supporting students. So how can you support all students in reducing stigma, increasing access, increasing understanding that there are services available? And then how can you really collaborate? We would collaborate a lot. How can you collaborate with your partners in the community? Because this doesn't belong to just one system. This is every system. So how can we all work together um, to really meet the needs of students as a community? Um, and then also, how do we respond to crisis? And I think, so I can't remember who was talking about this, but like, how do you return to campus? What sort of policies do you have in place when somebody's returning? And even that allows them to take perhaps a leave of absence without losing their, their, their course credits or losing their trajectory and not being able to continue. So we're very excited about this work and the partnership and all that we're learning from the partners. It's, it's, a, very, it's a very synergistic relationship. We're enjoying it. Agreed. So speaking of synergies, we've been hearing all day long a recurring theme of the Meadows Institute being a, a partner in initiatives across the state, which I know is really a benefit for us in our learning. Um, but so for the room today, Tegan, from that vantage point of having a, having a role in so many of the different conversations happening, what would you share with us are challenges and opportunities facing Texas higher education in terms of mental health? Yeah, so I will start with the opportunities because I'm going to take a strengths-based approach here. Um, so one is echoing what everybody has said here today is that we are here and there's like so much energy and collective commitment in this room and uh, that is a huge opportunity and something we can leverage to our advantage to really support student success. Um, the other thing that we've been talking about is there's been a lot more strategic investment in mental health and mental health initiatives. So not just with institutions, which we heard about on the, the pre-lunch panel, which was amazing. I loved hearing about all the, the institutional commitment um, and the very specific examples. Um, so not just within institutions, but also state funding. The Texas legislature has, has given more money to mental health. Um, and federally as well. And so that presents us with an opportunity to really strategically align our efforts and scale them to, to make a difference and make a movement towards um, better, better mental health in the entire campus community. So we're often like very student focused, but as the previous panels have mentioned, faculty and staff mental health is, is equally important um, because it's part of this whole ecosystem. So those are really some of the opportunities I see. And when we're um, looking at, like at the Meadows Institute, we take a real um, community focus. We look at the whole system. So we're not, we're, when we're talking about this, isn't just an institution's problem to solve. We really do want to look at opportunities to pull in community partners. So, for example, you know, what can be done in primary care? We really want to focus on early intervention and access to some of those early services. So, for those campuses who are lucky enough to have primary care on your campus, how can you integrate um, assessments into those primary care visits and then connection to services. There's you know gold standard model of the collaborative care model that really brings together um, psychiatry, primary care, and um, behavioral health clinicians uh, that is, you know, like I said, the gold standard. And so how can that be leveraged, whether it's on a, in a campus community or in the community more broadly to help improve that early access? Um, and then potentially freeing up some more space in your community to partner for those specialty services that students might need that can't be met on campus. Um, those, are, those are some of the real opportunities that we see in being able to leverage. Okay, I appreciate that. And um, just to bring in, I know we've been sharing examples from what we've learned with the cohort um, already today, but I wanna, I wanna call out just an example of what we've seen and the work that y'all are leading for us. Um, the, so it's, Austin Community College, I'm just gonna give a quick example there to, to the point that you were just making, has partnered with two community-based organizations to help connect students to health insurance through one partner and then to other um, services through another that, they're, that for that, that particular group of students is accessible most robustly in that way. So I just wanna give another example from our cohort of of a way that that's playing out. Well, and that's a really great example because I think that like connecting mental health to basic needs, that's one way to do it, right? So somebody showing up for 
Um, you know, maybe they have housing insecurity and you're, you're doing a basic needs assessment and do you also have mental health needs? Okay, how can I refer you? Oh, you don't have insurance. Okay, let me help you apply for insurance so that you can make this more accessible. Because we don't, often our, our, these needs are interconnected and so we need to recognize that. So that's why I'm so excited that we're thinking about mental health as one of those basic needs and foundation, foundational to student success. You started with a strength base. Yeah. Did you want to share challenges as well? <laughs> no, I don't. No. <laughs> no, to the point, as somebody said this morning, that we do. I think Commissioner Keller said. I have a challenge like, that you could probably give an yeah. asset-based answer to. <laughs> I think that's true. When the colleges, they, they look at trying to serve these, this comprehensive set of interconnected needs, how do you help them think about, like, break it down into ways that they can maybe isolate certain students who need more support in certain ways? Well, that's where I think it goes back to the data, the data piece that you all talked about. And why I think that's the, the work that you're doing with the community colleges through the, the Texas Success Center and providing the opportunity to collect some data because you, don't, you can't respond to the needs if you don't know what they are. And so I think data is one of those challenges. I also think, I really like the commissioner said that we should be talking about the challenges because that, that is important. If we don't talk about it, we can't do anything about it. Um, but, you know, this will be no surprise to anybody, but workforce. So there's a behavioral health workforce shortage um, all across Texas, and, but, you know, the nation as well. And so um, that affects our community colleges and our university systems. And so not only is it more difficult to find clinicians who can provide services on campus, but it's also harder to find those specialty um, providers out in the community who can recruit and retain qualified staff as well. So the workforce shortage is one of those challenges, but there are some exciting things happening relative to the workforce. So, um, you know, I think just yesterday, Governor Abbott tasked the Higher Ed Coordinating Board with um, looking at the healthcare workforce and the sh workforce shortages and um, coming up with some strategies and recommendations to help alleviate the stress that our communities are feeling. And we've already provided some, some, some support, so increase, increasing some of the salaries for um, community mental health providers. Um, even initiatives like our the Child Psychiatry Access Network is increasing psychiatric services to um, you know, communities that, that are partnering through there too. So there are great things being done and of course com the community college system in general is an incubator for things like credentialing. So how do we develop new credentials that can help meet that behavioral health workforce need? Yeah, so to continue with that, those great examples of, of challenges and ways that they're already being met on a policy level, or at least explored and, and looking for solutions. For everyone on the panel, what, what other challenges are, are you seeing and how can the folks in this room play a role in that? What is the policy lever? What's the institutional lever? How can we work together, problem solve? I'll, oh, okay, I'll go. Um, <laughs> so I think uh, one of the challenges um, uh, looking at a statewide plan for both four-year and two-year institutions is just the sheer size of our state. Um, as we are um, digging in and doing the planning um, with SHEO, um, that is one of the things that we're um, digging into is that that is one of our biggest challenges um, there's a lot of people doing a lot of work and we don't want to duplicate efforts and so making sure that we are understanding what's going on across the state um, and, and, and then also paying attention to context. So um, yes, we're a big state and geography and things are different across the state and so um, how do we address that? How do we um, think uh, from a statewide perspective to lift all students across the state? I build off of that real quick. So one of the things that I'm so excited about with this partnership with the Texas Success Center is that we really are using this Mining College Minds model that we've developed to help it through this learning community think about a way to approach post-secondary mental health and embed it in systems in a way that is both um, like concrete and implementation focused, but also able to be 
adjusted to meet the local context because Texas is huge and we have different types of campus and different types of student needs. And so we need to be able to have sort of a broad framework that we can use to guide our efforts, but then be able to modify it locally to meet the local context. And so I'm so excited about um, the potential that this has for the, the larger kind of the, the complications and the challenges that you were speaking to, you know. Um, but one of the challenges I was gonna say beyond that is financing. So how do we then scale and finance um, in a sustainable way this work? And so I think that's something we'll be digging, in, digging into a lot more. So I'll piggyback, piggyback on that as well. Um, I agree. I think that it's a really hard time to be a leader. Um, it's great to be in Texas. It's great to have a room full of friends that care about this issue together. But this is hard. This is hard work, and it's sometimes emotionally heavy work that we're doing. And so I would just say that as leaders and as emerging leaders um, are in our campuses, that we spend an, especial, an especial eye towards taking care of ourselves, uh, taking care of sort of our immediate influence, whoever's in our office, um, to keep each other encouraged around this hard but good work that we need to be doing together. Um, but then also as we're building out new um, collaborations, so making new friends, um, how do we still spin all the plates we already had spinning and still take on all this, really this is expanding the community college mission like has never been expanded before and taking on a lot of new responsibilities. And thank you for calling it out. That means it costs money too. Like, so you heard the examples of a couple of colleges and how, how much more money they're going to have. Uh, but this is a big state and it, 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 was, it, it played out differently for different colleges. Not everybody had a big windfall, and, but they all have the same sort of obligation or responsibility to their, their students to have these kind of services. And so I think that's some of the big challenges that our leaders are talking about right now. Dad there? Good, you got it. Yeah, Amen. Nice yeah. <laughs> and, and thank you for, Dr. Farrell, for reminding us that it, it isn't the same sort of additional funding for, for all colleges. Because um, I know listening to, to Chancellor Flores, I was like, sweet, 25 million more for everybody. We're gonna get this solved, no problem. Um, so appreciate that, that reminder um, of, the, of the different ways that, that campuses are gonna have to react to this. Um, any, and you may not have any, any advice for campuses as they're thinking about ways to prioritize mental health within the budget that they have within the, so we, we heard three examples. Um, and so <laughs> I understand you have more examples than that. Um, we heard three examples of, of ways to sit down and like really make difficult decisions that help prioritize this within a, in a context. Anything you guys would add um, as a campus tries to think about ways to prioritize? You know, the first thing that comes to mind is I was really inspired yesterday at the um, convening that we had with the student panel. And the student, student and young person panel, was, it was fantastic. And so the, the biggest advice I would have is talk to your students. Um, that will let you know what is effective, what are they going to, what, what do they want, what do they need, where, where, what will they attend, and really what speaks to them. So I think that, that is the biggest piece. And so like one, invite students to be part of the work, part of the planning, part of the brainstorming. Um, and, and be really intentional about that and think about how you're, you're inviting those students to the table and the ways in which you are supporting their input and their involvement. So not, not as just sort of like a token student representing, but how are you actually um, trying to get their perspective and supporting their, their input. Um, and then I just keep going back to the data piece. Um, so I think the student input, input is one part, but then the, the larger scale um, system-wide data collection can really inform how you prioritize and where you see the most need and where it will be useful to, to kind of channel your resources. Thank you for that reminder, bringing us back to the students. And I know we've heard a couple of examples throughout the day too of ways that you can use um, students as as colleagues and professionals in this work as well. Um, and that's one of the partners, Active Minds, that we've worked with is just students wanna be active in supporting each other. And so really 
appreciate that, that reminder of, of what a great um, partner in this work mm -hmm. students are. Um, and it's important for systems to be cognizant of the, the different things happening in students' lives. So their parents, they're working, they're doing, and make sure that we are working on how to adapt systems to support them in that, but really partnering with them in this yeah. work. Well, because I think it's easy to forget all of the things that they're juggling. So we talked yeah. about that today. I loved it when we had to like close our eyes and picture a student. Did you picture a, a student who's working three jobs? Did you picture a parenting student? I mean, that's true. They're juggling so many things. And like, I think the quote of the conference for me so far has been from a student yesterday. Yesterday, I think it was Aspa. She said, oh, and she's here too. <laughs> she said, if you want to improve student engagement, you need to engage students. <laughs> and it seems really clear, but it is brilliant, right? <laughs> and, and she went on to talk about it's not just like asking for their, their input, but it is like meaningfully and authentically engaging students. And I think that is a critical piece of it. Mm -hmm. And over the past couple of years, that's what, what we've learned is sometimes the assumptions that we've had at the beginning didn't, didn't hold out. Um, and sometimes they were good ideas, but not for all students, right? So I know that um, there's the the idea of, of technology, right? Like we can telehealth, we can te tele mental health is gonna solve everything. We, it'll be much easier to get access to students. And I know that through over the past couple of years, we've learned that that works really well for some students, but a lot of students don't want to have mental care that way. Um, and so just realizing that, that then, then we have to think about what a, what are, how do we provide in-person access for, for the students who want it? So challenging our assumptions by listening to, to what students are saying. Um, and I will also say, again, to lift up what we've, what we've learned, really pre appreciated student perspective yesterday in conversations, reminding us that, again, if it's working students, some of your conversations may have to take place after some of the traditional office hour um, timelines, and that Another thing we can do is let students bring their whole selves to the conversation, and sometimes their whole self involves small people that come with them. <laughs> so, like, making things be family friendly whenever we can. So, again, too. just like the wealth of resources, of, of tidbits and insights that we've gotten over, over the past 24 hours, and for certain the past two years, has really, um, really helped change my perspective on, on this work for sure. In the spirit of listening to students, sorry to interrupt you. No, no. Uh, I'm going to give a shout out to Trellis Strategies and the Trellis Survey of Student Wellness. So well done. Um, we asked all the community colleges in Texas to fill out, the, the, to conduct this survey of their students and their needs. And they did that as pre-work and they brought that data, Trellis data, it was awesome, to the institute and they used it in their action planning for how they can think about how students uh, uh, when they're honest in, a, in an, an anonymous survey, what they're gonna tell you about themselves. So if I could just give uh, one thing that was, I thought was just a really big finding from the study. Uh, so this is Texas Community College students talking about their basic needs. Um, when they're asked, how many of you have housing insecurities? 50% of them. How many have food and so, I mean, all the way from couch hopping, being evicted and getting into new rental to being all the way homeless, like 50%, almost every other, well, every other person you pass in the hallway has a home, a housing insecurity. For food insecurity, it was 49%. I mean, it's, it is rampant, and so when we talk about stigma-free, or maybe we say normalizing, when you're sitting at a table with 10 people, just know that five people are having struggles of some kind, and probably the other five didn't fill out the survey, right? Because we're human beings, and you know, human life is complicated. Um, so I just really wanted to thank the Trellis Survey for helping us have those kind of conversations and think about our students and what they need. Thank you. And I think just the one other idea I want to lift up before we get to our last few questions um, is, is this idea of how much context matters, too. So I think we've heard over and over again that part of the reason it's so important to do surveys of your students and have focus groups and conversations and engage your students um, and have this iterative process is, is that some things don't work the same way with your population, or you may not be implementing it the way you thought you were. And so just being really in constant communication with students to be able to iterate and pivot is, is so important. Yeah. So, well, as we finish up, so I have two, two questions. 
Don't, it's not a surprise. <laughs> oh. Um, but so we, we have one final question that we want to end on. But before that, just any additional thoughts around these topics that y'all want to share for, for the room full of stakeholders we have today? It does not have to be. Just wanted to give you a moment in case there were any additional thoughts. I was just thinking what Cynthia just said really underscores how interconnected all of these basic needs are. And so just to really, and, and I think I saw that same report too that showed that like 45% of students had struggled with generalized anxiety. And so there is a lot of interconnection among these needs. And so a need to really embed our responses into our systems so that, that anywhere a student goes who shares that they have a need, is um, met with a resource. And um, I think that goes for faculty and staff too. So how are we, one, how are we supporting their mental health? We talked a lot about culture today. How do we create a culture of wellness in our campus communities so that faculty and staff are taking care of themselves as well? And um, yeah, oh, and training them. Because again, they're like the first, you know, often the first people who know about these needs. So ensuring that they know how to respond if a student has a mental health need or has a, another need that, that they can help support. Thank you. I would just um, say to, uh, in the spirit of building community um, around our work together, that um, if, if you are experiencing some sort of challenge, you don't know how to do something on a campus, or you said, oh, I, you know, I heard about this you know, program, um, and, and, uh, but don't know where to get started, um, please do reach out. Uh, the coordinating board is here to be a resource and partner and an advocate for you. Um, and I think that was one thing when I was on a campus that I never wanted to say, oh, we don't do that really well, right? Um, but we really do want to know how we can um, help and, and, and to understand um, what kind of uh, challenges you're experiencing on campus on various things. So um, please do reach out, student success at highered.texas.gov. Not long at all. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And so I know as for the final panel, and I'm about to ask the final question, um, and it's, it's been a really um, robust, engaging day. I appreciate there's been so much excitement and, and optimism, but also understanding the challenges that we're all working with here, right? Some very real resource constraints mm -hmm. and very real workforce pipeline um, limitations, and, and the health and well-being of honestly everyone in this room is connected to this work in some way. And so I know that there can be a lot to sit with and a lot to process. And so, but again, back to the fact that we've heard so many encouraging words today and being able to spend this time in community with all of you, I know is giving me hope, optimism, and motivation. So my last question for you, is as we finish out, what is giving you hope, optimism, and motivation to continue the work? I think just um, the fact that there's standing room only in this room is, is uh, gives me hope. Anytime I go to um, a convening, that is always, um, uh, it's always telling of who's hosting. So thank you to Trellis, um, but also on the topic, and the energy that's that is um, on campuses towards a towards a topic. So for me, that's that's um, hope. I think this is also um, when you think, you know, uh, and I'm just going to over my 25 years, um, the most open we've been about mental health, not only just personally um, as as practitioners but also as in our own lives, um, but also as practitioners helping students and um, what the impact um, both to the student and to you. Um, and so I, I think that gives me hope is that we have this open conversation, honest conversation, um, and that we're all coming together. Um, there was uh, one of the Trellis Foundation board members who said, let's just lock arms and let's go. Like, that's, I love that because um, this, is, this, uh, this is the most, um, from, a, from a higher ed perspective, we're in this together. And um, in this time over the last you know, um, couple of years, I've really seen us 
band together and say, let's do this together. I'm not in competition with you. Um, we're All of our students are all of our students, so let's make sure that they all succeed, and no matter what um, you know, .edu, the email address that they have. So uh, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Well, I was going to say this room, so <laughs> you know, really stole that. Um, so everyone in this room and in this collective energy that's really committed to this work is, is wonderful, um, but also all of our partners in this work. That gives me so much hope. So partners like the Trellis Foundation, Greater Texas Foundation, Texas Pioneer Foundation, like all of these people who are supporting us and our work with the Texas, Texas, Texas Success Center in, um, and all of the institutions who are in this room and not in this room. Um, to really work together, lock arms, and um, find find something that works, and that we're all um, doing this with the like a student and well-being focus. So I, I love that we're all sort of like collectively gathered around this a similar goal and a similar north star, and um, you know trying to get there together, learning together, growing together. So. This is a testimony to how collaborative this team is because we all three had the same answer. <laughs> we all feel very grateful to have great friends to do great work with. So if I, if I could take liberty just to give one, uh, one message, and that is when we were at the Institute, we had a fabulous plenary speaker. Um, she was, she's the president at Valencia College, Kathleen Polinski, and she was telling a story about how she has helped her campus respond to students' basic needs. And so just a very short story, there's a, a mother who had three kids who were found sleeping uh, in their parking lot. So she had a, a tent with a little one and a medium one, and then in her car she had sleeping her 15-year-old. And when she was found, they asked her, you know, what, why, is she, why is she sleeping? Obviously, she's homeless, but um, she said she was sleeping on the college campus because she felt the most safe in her, all, all she could have slept anywhere, she felt the most safe at her college campus. And so, of course, immediately the administration went into action and tried to figure out what are we going to do for this woman, how can we help her, and think about all the homeless people, all the homeless students, all the um, students with mental health issues and with childcare issues, and they took a whole day just talking about different partnerships they could build or different ways they could commu uh, work with the community or with the, um, with the, with the city and helping this woman, and she said one of her regrets was that they took a whole day to talk about it, and then she slept another night in their parking lot, and so she said, let's at least stop what we're doing and help the person that's right in front of us. And so they helped her, they helped her get into a hotel, they helped her, while, so she could get off the street the next night, they helped her get long-term housing, got her back in school, helped her with childcare and all those other interrelated uh, stressors that she had in her life. So I just thought that was a beautiful story and a good encouragement to all of us to do what we can with what's in front of us each day. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you again to the panelists. Um, thank you for joining us.